Check, 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 check one, two, check, check, check one, two. Check, check, check one, two, check, check, check one, two.
Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. I just want to make sure everyone can get settled in um, as we get ready for our seminar. As people are settling in, um, I want to go ahead and give you a few uh, brief announcements. Um, my name is Norbert Wilson. I'm a faculty member here at the Freeman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Uh, I serve on the uh, Freeman Speaker Series Committee, and as the uh, first seminar of the semester and of the academic year, I want to welcome you all. I believe that we have a really exciting group of speakers over the course of this semester, and we're still developing the list of speakers for next semester. So uh, I'm looking forward to all of our speakers. And today is actually kind of unique in that what we decided, and this was with the support of the committee from last year, um, is to develop a series. We're going to have a three-part series on guidelines, on the, on the dietary guidelines for Americans, the Physical Activity Act guidelines, um, Russ Pate will come and uh, Russell Pate will give a presentation, and then later in the semester, we're going to have a panel to discuss those guidelines. And so if you are interested in contributing questions that build upon those, um, you can use the website that we have for the speaker series to uh, submit questions if you wanted to kind of develop a series of questions as the semester proceeds. So I encourage you to do that, to engage in the questions and ideas around the guidelines. Um, there are a few more seats as uh, up here up front, and there are a few scattered around. So um, wait for everyone to get settled in. Um, for those uh, students who are participating in the lunch um, with Dr. Uh, Hugh afterwards, um, if you would, at the end of the question and answer period, if you would come to the front, and we'll escort you to 133 uh, in the back, um, and that's that. Um, for those of you who are interested in um, eating uh, lunch with our speakers um, in the subsequent weeks, please let um, Hollis uh, Gesson know, and you'll see that announcement come out every week. Uh, so just watch out for those. Um, and I think that's about everything in terms of announcements. Oh, for the students also, if uh, for all students, we encourage you to go on to the website to uh, register your participation in the seminar. Um, please note that we will live stream many of the seminars and uh, archive them so you can watch them later if um, you need or are interested. So I think that's all of the background information. Um, great. So our speaker series uh, normally starts at 12.15. Um, we'll, uh, the speaker has until 1 o'clock and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Please note that our speaker series is right before another class and uh, the instructor of that class is really clear that we need to move on. So let's make sure we do that. And there will be opportunities if you have questions uh, to, to follow afterwards. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker is Dr. Frank Hugh. Uh, he is the chair of the Department of Nutrition and the Frank, uh, Frederick J. Stair Professor of Nutrition and Epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, he is engaged in a number of activities around obesity and epidemiology uh, here in the Boston area and has won a number of awards. Um, but particularly for our presentation today, uh, he has served on the Institute of Medicine Committee on Preventing Global the Global Epidemic of Cardiovascular Disease and the AHA ACC uh, Obesity Guideline Expert Panel and was on the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee uh, for USDA and HHS, um, which is the group that comes up with the Dietary Guidelines. Um, he has served on a number of uh, editorial boards, including Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, Diabetes Care, and Clinical Chemistry. And Dr. Q is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Hugh. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and it's always, always a pleasure to, to come here and to uh, see so many uh, friends and, and colleagues. Um, so I was asked to talk about 
uh, my experiences in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Uh, thank God I'm not on the 2020 <laughs> committee, instead on the 2015 committee. It's always good to talk about the past, not the current or, or, the, or the future. Uh, so let me start with a brief history of uh, dietary guidelines in the U.S. More than 100 years ago, uh, W.O. Uh, at, uh, at Water, the first director of the USDA's Office of Exper Experiment Stations, uh, developed the first uh, food guidance to improve the health and the well-being of the U.S. population. At that time, uh, the guidelines was focused on uh, sufficient uh, caloric intake and make sure that uh, caloric intake meets the, uh, the physiological needs of the, the body. Um, and then in 1916, uh, the first USDA uh, food guide uh, featured five food groups, uh, fruits and vegetables, milk, eggs, fish, meat, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, cereals, and then sugars and fats. So those are the two one of the five essential food groups recommended in um, uh, 1916. Uh, as you know, before the Second World War, uh, the uh, U.S. dietary guidelines uh, were focused on uh, reducing uh, undernutrition and uh, nutrient deficiencies, but after the war, uh, the dietary guidelines or the food guidance uh, shifted to uh, reducing obesity and obesity-related chronic diseases. Uh, in 1958, uh, the USDA published a new food guide, basic four, uh, the four groups instead of the five groups that I mentioned earlier, uh, two servings of the milk group, one serving of meat group, um, four servings of uh, fruits and vegetables and four servings of uh, greens, uh, emphasizing um, getting enough uh, nutrients. And then in 1977, uh, the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs established uh, the first dietary goals for the U.S. Uh, this is actually the precursor to the first dietary guidelines for Americans uh, uh, released in 1980. Um, so. Over the years, um, the uh, focus of the dietary guidelines for the U.S. populations have changed a lot uh, due to changes in um, the, uh, the, the food systems and also changes in uh, disease patterns in the, in the U.S. population. So in 1980, the, um, the first dietary guidelines for Americans or the DGAs uh, was, uh, were released. Uh, at that time, uh, there was not much evidence in the uh, recommendations were pretty straightforward. For example, the first recommendation is to eat a variety of foods. You really don't need much evidence to <laughs> make this kind of recommendation, right? And then over the years, uh, as more and more evidence uh, on nutrition and health become available uh, and the recommendations become uh, more sophisticated, become more quantitative, and also the process of the developing dietary guidelines become more evidence-based. Uh, one of the major uh, advances uh, in developing the dietary guidelines uh, was in uh, 2008 when the USDA established um, the uh, Nutrition Evidence Library, or NEL, to conduct systematic reviews of the literature and the, uh, uh, ev evaluate the quality of the science, which can be used to develop uh, dietary recommendations. So I think that's an uh, important advance in terms of developing uh, the dietary guidelines. As you know, the uh, purpose of the DGAs is to provide a, a science-based advice for Americans ages two years and older. Um, the uh, primary goal is to prevent, not treatment, of, not to treat chronic diseases. So primary prevention is the main uh, goal of the dietary recommendations. The target audience include uh, policy makers, nutrition educators, health professionals, and of course the, the general public. And the DGAs uh, produced jointly by the USDA and HHS uh, required by law. The DGAs are updated every five years. So I had the privilege to serve on the uh, 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, or the DGAC. Uh, it's quite a lengthy and time-consuming process. Um, the DGAC was uh, 
established in the beginning of 2013, uh, it took almost two years for the committee to uh, review and synthesize a vast amount of literature on diet and health, and then uh, develop the scientific report of the DGAC, and uh, the report was released in uh, the beginning of 2015. And then it took another year for the USDA and HHS to translate the scientific report into official uh, DGAs. Um, during this process, uh, the DGAC members were not involved. The uh, 2015 DGAC uh, included 14 members. Um, Barbara Minan, who used to be at uh, Boston University, was the chair. Alice, uh, sitting here, uh, the vice chair. And uh, this is a very uh, interdisciplinary, diverse panel. Uh, we have uh, epidemiologists, uh, food scientists, behavior researchers, policy researchers. Uh, in the beginning, I thought how it's possible for such a diverse panel to reach uh, consensus on a wide range of controversial issues. But in the end, we did it. So um, that's why we were able to publish the scientific report of the uh, 2015 DGAC. Uh, we also had um, Tim Griffin from Tufts and uh, Michael Ham from um, uh, Michigan State University uh, serve, to serve as a consultant on um, um, issues related to food sustainability. So the 2015 DGAC uh, was divided into five subcommittees and four working groups. Uh, I was on uh, SC2, Dietary Patterns and Health Outcomes, and also SC5, uh, Food Sustainability and Safety. I was also on um, the added sugar and the saturated fat uh, working group. So you can imagine that it's a tremendous amount of work for the committee members and also the uh, USDA colleagues uh, to uh, do the um, nutrition review and develop the, the scientific report because there's just so, so many topics to cover and so much literature to uh, review and synthesize. The uh, DGAC process was intended to be transparent, ac uh, accessible, and systematic. Uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, six public meetings, and all the meeting materials were put online, and um, the committee received thousands and thousands of uh, public comments. Um, in February 2015, uh, the committee's uh, report was uh, published uh, online. Uh, it's a big report. I don't know how many of you uh, ha had time to read this 600-page document. Um, uh, it would be a good uh, nighttime reading if you don't have any, uh, anything else to do. Uh, uh, we used uh, four uh, different sources of evidence uh, to develop the report, uh, which include original uh, systematic reviews, review of uh, existing meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and, and uh, uh, various uh, reports, and uh, food pattern modeling, and uh, original uh, data analysis. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the NEL systematic review uh, is a very important part of the uh, evidence review process for the DGAC. Um, so the, um, uh, this process um, uh, involves several steps. Um, first, of course, we have to identify uh, topics and systematic review questions. And then um, uh, our USDA staff uh, conducted uh, systematic literature search at, and then uh, conducted data extraction, um, evidence synthesizing, and then um, uh, uh, grading the evidence and draft uh, conclusion statements. So this is a pretty time-consuming process. Um, and that's why we could only uh, use the NEL uh, uh, reviews, systematic reviews, to address uh, less than 30% of all the questions uh, proposed uh, or selected by the by the committee because uh, it just takes so much time to conduct uh, 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 each of the systematic reviews. Uh, Predefined uh, criteria were used to grade the uh, the evidence. Um, so the criteria include several elements, including um, a risk of bias, uh, quantity of the uh, evidence, uh, consistency of the evidence public health impact and then uh, generalizability. So each area of the evidence uh, was graded uh, according to 
uh, those pri uh, predefined criteria, so the evidence can be uh, graded uh, um, into one of the four categories, strong, uh, moderate, limited, or grade not assign assignable. The second approach is to use evidence from uh, published systematic reviews or meta-analysis or reports from uh, leading scientific organizations or federal agencies. Again, uh, predefined criteria were used to grade the quality of evidence from existing uh, meta-analysis and the systematic reviews. And the third approach is uh, food pattern modeling, uh, which is used to determine the hypothetical effects on nutrient content and adequacy of the recommended uh, food patterns by the DGAC. And the, the fourth approach is to uh, conduct original data analysis to address questions uh, regarding um, dietary intake trends, the prevalence of health conditions in the U.S. population uh, using uh, national data sets such as uh, enhanced and uh, national health interview surveys and so on and so forth. So this is a quick summary uh, uh, about what's new in the um, 2015 DGSA report. That's my own summary, not the committee's summary. Um, first, the report uh, was focused on dietary, overall dietary patterns rather than individual nutrients. Second, um, uh, the committee removed the upper limit for total fat, put more emphasis on type of fat or the quality of fat, but uh, it retained 10% upper limit on saturated fat. Um, an important change uh, for the 2015 uh, DGAC report is that it didn't carry forward the upper limit on dietary cholesterol, which uh, was um, 300 milligrams per day. And uh, uh, the rationale was that uh, there is the correlation between dietary cholesterol and the serum cholesterol was pretty weak. And uh, there is uh, no um, good evidence that uh, um, higher intake of dietary cholesterol had significant uh, effects on uh, cardiovascular disease. However, this issue has continued to be controversial, and you may uh, have seen recent uh, papers on uh, egg consumption and cardiovascular disease, and some of the studies uh, uh, have shown a positive association, but other studies continue to show um, uh, no association between egg consumption and the risk of uh, CBD. And this is the first time the committee considered the impact of uh, food production and consumption on our environment, and the key recommendation is to reduce consumption of red meat uh, to improve the health of humans and our planet. And it's also the first time uh, the committee set a 10% caloric upper limit on added sugar. And um, the committee um, retained uh, 2,300 milligrams per day sodium uh, limit. And it's also the first time the committee recommended moderate coffee consumption can be included as a part of a healthy diet and that's the, um, this is the least controversial part of our recommendations. And uh, we got very little pushback on this recommendation, even though all the other recommendations uh, have become somewhat uh, controversial. Um, and then uh, another uh, conclusion from the report is that uh, uh, farm raise, most farmers and wild caught uh, seafood have a similar amount of omega-3 fatty acids. And finally, uh, the re report um, emphasized the promotion of a culture of health uh, in which healthy food choices should be made accessible, affordable, and, uh, and normative. Right. Well, so here, um, uh, we're going to talk about the refined grains. Um, so the uh, refined grain recommendation was included as part of the diet, uh, healthy dietary pattern recommendation because we couldn't come up with the quantitative cutter point for uh, consumption of refined grains. It's much easier to come up with uh, quantitative cutter points for saturated fat, for sodium, for, for added sugar. But the common characteristics of healthy dietary patterns identified 
by uh, the committee include high intake of uh, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, seafood, and so on and so forth, but lower consumption of red and processed meat, and low intake of sugar sweetened foods and uh, drinks, and uh, also low intake of refined grains. So refined grain, uh, re uh, lower intake of refined grains were included as part of the recommendation, but uh, without uh, quantitative cut points. And the committee also emphasized that healthy dietary patterns can be achieved in many ways and should be tailored to individuals' food and cultural preferences and health conditions. So it means that one size doesn't fit all, and people can um, uh, develop their own uh, healthy dietary patterns based on their own uh, food preferences and, and health conditions. Uh, in terms of dietary patterns and sustainability, uh, the committee um, concluded that uh, a dietary pattern higher in plant-based foods and lower in animal-based foods is more health-promoting and also associated with lesser environmental impact than the average U.S. diet. And this can be achieved through a variety of uh, dietary patterns, including the healthy U.S. style uh, pattern, the healthy vegetarian pattern, and uh, the healthy Mediterranean uh, style pattern. However, those environmental sustainability recommendations uh, did not sit very well with the meat industry. Uh, when our report uh, was released, uh, it drew a very sharp criticism from the, uh, the meat industry. You can see the headlines here. Uh, the, uh, the meat industry sharpens its likes over a federal nutrition panel's advice. A pretty uh, literate. <laughs> And the Congress didn't like the uh, environmental sustainability recommendations either. Congress nutritionists don't talk about the environment. So, as you can imagine, the political pressure um, is pretty high in terms of the, uh, uh, whether the environmental sustainability recommendations should be included or not. And the, in the end, all those uh, environmental sustainability recommendations were omitted in the official uh, dietary guidelines for Americans when uh, it was released in the early uh, 2016. And of course, the red meat recommendation was also uh, re uh, removed. Um, except those two omissions, I think uh, the vast majority of the recommendations made by the committee were retained in the official uh, DJs, especially on um, uh, healthy uh, dietary patterns and also the um, the quantitative uh, upper limits for uh, saturated fat, for um, added sugar, and, and for sodium. So for the most part, I think uh, the um, official DGAs um, um, keep uh, the majority, the vast majority of recommendations by the, uh, by the, um, by the committee members. Uh, however, uh, the key recommendations on environmental sustainability and uh, red meat uh, uh, consumption uh, were uh, uh, omitted. And that has uh, caused uh, a lot of uproar um, in, uh, among the uh, um, uh, national and international organizations. Uh, this is a statement uh, put out by the American Cancer Society. Uh, it says that by omitting specific diet recommendations such as eating less red and processed meat, the guidelines miss uh, significant, uh, critical and significant opportunity to reduce suffering and death from cancer. Uh, but releasing the uh, official DGAs was not the end of the story. Um, in 2016, uh, Congress um, asked National Academy of Medicine, um, NAM, uh, to review the DGA process. Um, so they actually set aside $1 million uh, for the um, National Academy of Medicine to conduct the study. So a new committee uh, was formed to review the work of the old committee. <laughs> this is usually the case, right? So uh, the NAM review committee was chaired actually by Robert Russell from, from here. Uh, it also included 14 members. I don't know whether it's a coincidence or not. And it was so interesting that uh, some of the NAM, um, several of the NAM review committee members become uh, 2020 uh, DGSA members. Uh, the, um, this committee uh, published two uh, very important reports and made uh, a number of uh, recommendations to improve the DGAC uh, process. 
Uh, one of the key recommendations is to broaden the scope of the DGA um, to pregnant women and children from birth to 24 uh, months. Uh, the report stated that uh, it is essential that DGA be developed for all Americans whose health could benefit by improving diet. So the scope of the 2020 DGA is much broader than the previous uh, 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 DGAs. The 2020 DGAC was uh, announced in March uh, this year. Um, it has uh, 20 members. It's bigger than uh, the, the 2015 DGAC. The chair um, is uh, Dr. Barbara Sheeman from uh, UC Davis. She was on the NAM review committee. And the vice chair is Ron uh, Kleiman uh, from MGH. And uh, you can tell that there are several pediatricians um, in, on this committee. And uh, also Tavares, also from MGH and uh, from our department, uh, uh, she uh, has done extensive work on um, childhood obesity. Uh, so like our committee, uh, this panel is very interdisciplinary and with uh, many different uh, expertise. And uh, I, I think uh, the diversity, diversity of the background of the committee members is very important to, uh, for, this type of, uh, for this type of work. Uh, the 2020 uh, DGAC was divided to uh, seven uh, subcommittees, uh, dietary patterns, pregnancy and lactation, uh, birth to 24 months, beverages and added sugars, dietary fats and seafood, frequency of eating, and um, uh, data analysis and food pattern uh, modeling. So this, uh, some of the subcommittees overlap with uh, what we had uh, in uh, 2015. However, uh, this 2020 DGA process has already become very controversial even before the uh, committee completed their work. Uh, some of you may have seen the Washington Post article uh, published uh, just a couple weeks ago how the Trump administration limited the scope of the USDA's 2020 dietary guidelines. How many of you have seen this article? Quite few. So uh, several issues were raised uh, in this article. One is regarding uh, the ex exclusion of uh, important topics such as the health effects of consuming uh, red meat and processed meat, also processed foods and, and sodium. And another uh, critical issue regarding um, uh, the evidence review process. Um, so um, the current protocol of the 2020 DGSA is to exclude uh, existing uh, meta-analysis and systematic reviews. Uh, this is uh, in contrast to um, previous DGACs, as I mentioned earlier, um, the uh, com uh, only 30% uh, of the questions um, proposed by the committee were addressed by um, the uh, nutrition um, evidence library um, and, uh, systematic review conducted by the USDA scientists. And 45% of the questions were actually addressed by um, uh, evidence from existing meta-analysis or systematic reviews or reports. So I, I think uh, uh, this is surprising and, and also puzzling given that uh, the um, NAM review committee actually um, recommended that uh, um, it would be advantageous to leverage existing systematic reviews, meta-analysis and reports to minimize unnecessary replication of efforts. Um, so my thinking is that, I mean, this is still in the early stage of the 2020 DGAC and they still have time and uh, opportunities to uh, modified their protocol to um, include not just the uh, evidence from the systematic reviews conducted by the USDA scientists, but also uh, published uh, uh, evidence from published uh, meta-analysis and, uh, and the systematic reviews. There are uh, additional questions about the uh, DGSA process. Um, the NAM review uh, committee um, recommended that uh, the selection of the DCAC members uh, should be done by uh, independent third party rather than by the USDA um, so that the process can be transparent, in, uh, independent, and, and also better manage uh, uh, um, 
uh, management of potential conflict interests. Uh, I, I don't know whether that's possible, given that uh, uh, the DGA is uh, um, supported by uh, the, the federal government. And uh, currently, uh, the uh, DGA is uh, updated five, uh, every five years. So the question is, is the uh, five-year cycle updated too soon? Um, I mean, this is just a one grand cycle. And the question is how much new science um, can be produced to change the dietary guidelines should be 10 years. Um, and then a uh, the question has been raised about the um, one of the mandates of the DGAs is to meet the nutrient adequacy based on uh, DRI uh, values, uh, which were developed uh, by the National Academies in the 1990s. And many of those values were uh, already outdated. Another issue is that in some areas, there's just too many meta-analysis and systematic reviews. And um, the quality of many of those meta-analysis is, is very poor, because almost everyone can do a meta-analysis as long as you have an internet collection, right? You can do that in your garage, in your basement. Uh, and there is a journal called the World Journal of Meta-Analysis. So you can, you can publish everything as long as you, you pay them. So. So the quality of the meta-analysis, the micro-reviews uh, uh, need to be uh, considered uh, when we review evidence um, uh, from uh, those meta-analysis and systematic reviews. And another question issue is that um, the current DGAs uh, focus on individual behavior changes, but we know that uh, our individual behaviors are shaped by our food environment and uh, economical uh, status. and. Uh, I think it's really important uh, to uh, consider both individual responsibility and uh, social responsibility when we make dietary recommendations to improve uh, um, uh, dietary be um, behaviors and, uh, um, and the health uh, status. And now uh, there are tremendous interest in uh, several emerging areas such as uh, personalized nutrition, microbiome, uh, organic food, ultra-processed foods, uh, the evidence uh, at this point in those areas is still limited. However, um, the evidence uh, has been growing uh, rapidly and will continue to grow. So the question is how those uh, areas will be incorporated into future DJs. And the big elephant in the room is still environmental sustainability uh, because this is uh, a public health crisis right now. Um, this year, uh, two influential international uh, uh, reports uh, have focused on uh, the role of uh, food production, food uh, consumption uh, in uh, climate change. Uh, Earlier this year, um, the Eat Lancet um, Commission published a report on uh, our food system, planetary health, and human health. And just uh, uh, a few weeks ago, the UN IPCC uh, published uh, a big report on our food system and, uh, uh, and our diet and uh, climate change. Uh, both reports uh, recommended um, a substantial reduction in red meat and processed meat consumption and uh, a shift, a uh, global shift uh, of our dietary patterns from meat-based uh, patterns to uh, more plant-based dietary patterns to improve both uh, human and the planetary health. So those two international reports are very important, very influential. Uh, however, at this point, uh, no one would expect that the 2020 DJs will uh, take into account uh, this very important public health issue right now. Uh, there is also growing evidence that uh, climate change will uh, decrease uh, the nutrient contents of crops, including uh, amino acids, um, minerals and vitamins. Uh, so this will uh, exacerbate undernutrition or nutrient deficiencies, especially in low-income and, uh, and the middle-income countries. Uh, so I think the relationship between our diet and, um, uh, and the environment is, uh, is uh, reciprocal. So our food production and, uh, and the consumption have a huge impact on the environment, and the climate change can also uh, impact the nutrient contents of our, uh, our foods and, and the nutri nutritional status of individuals. 
Uh, globally, we are facing triple threat of uh, obesity and the nutrition and the climate change. Uh, currently, we have 7.5 billion people on Earth. Um, out of the 7.5 billion people, 2 billion people are overweight or obese. Another 2 billion people um, are undernourished, one way or another. And then um, in 2050, the world population will grow to 10 billion people. So I think a uh, very important question is how to feed uh, 10 billion people uh, a healthy and also sustainable diet uh, in 2050. Uh, in recent months, um, plant-based um, uh, meat alternatives have become very popular. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried Impossible Burgers or Beyond Burgers. How many? Oh, my goodness, more than half. Um, so, uh, recently we published a, a commentary in JAMA after the question, can plant-based meat alternatives be part of a healthy and a sustainable diet? I think it's a tough question because we don't have much research to demonstrate uh, the health impacts of uh, uh, those meat alternatives. Uh, I mean, those meat alternatives, uh, based on novel food technologies, uh, are engineered to replicate the taste, flavor, appearance, and sensory experiences of eating meat. Uh, so they look like meat and taste like meat, but they're plant-based. So people have this kind of... Uh, 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 perception that uh, because it's plant-based, it must be good for you, for your health, and also for the health of the planet. Uh, but at this point, I think there is no evidence to suggest uh, that they can substitute for healthy diets focused on minimally processed plant foods. Compared to a uh, beef burger, um, Beyond Burger or uh, Impossible Burger is likely to substantially reduce the environmental impact uh, based on um, analysis commissioned by this company, Beyond Food. Um, eating uh, uh, plant-based burgers instead of beef burgers would dramatically reduce the use of water and land and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, reduce energy use. However, if you look at the nutrient profile, compare the nutrient profile of uh, plant-based burgers uh, with that of uh, traditional beef burgers, uh, it's not very different. Uh, both have um, a pretty high amount of uh, calories, and uh, uh, the plant-based burgers typically have a high amount of sodium. And uh, they're highly processed, um, and there are many ingredients in those uh, plant-based burgers that um, you and me wouldn't be able to recognize. Uh, for example, uh, uh, human iron was added to the Impossible Burgers to uh, enhance the meaty taste and uh, flavor of eating meat. But uh, studies have shown that uh, eating too much human iron uh, increased iron overload and increased risk of uh, uh, developing type 2 diabetes. So there are many um, health uh, issues uh, or concerns about um, uh, eating uh, this type of uh, uh, plant-based meat alternatives. Uh, having said that, I think I mean, certainly there, there is a room to improve the nutrient composition or nutrient profile of plant-based meat alternatives. And given the potential benefits of uh, those products on um, the health of the planet, I think uh, we should not completely dismiss uh, those products, um, on, the, uh, on the country, I think uh, uh, should uh, continue to improve the nutrient profile of those products so that they can be um, uh, beneficial for both human health and the health of the planet. Uh, it is projected that um, the plant-based meat alternative market will continue to grow in uh, coming years and decades. And um, the, uh, on the other hand, the uh, uh, conventional meat market will be shrinking. Uh, a new meat product on the horizon is uh, cultured meat or lab-grown meat. How many of you have heard uh, lab-grown meat? Do you grow any meat in your lab? <laughs> so this is really fascinating technology. Uh, it's the cell-based technology to grow meat products uh, in the lab without uh, raising and slaughtering animals. So from animal welfare and, um, uh, and, um, um, and also environmental point of view, this should be a good thing, right? 
However, the question is what kind of uh, uh, health impact uh, uh, this type of product will have on humans. And then uh, in terms of diet, future dietary guidelines, how are we going to talk about uh, the evolution of uh, our food system and uh, the um, uh, new products on, uh, on uh, people's health and uh, what kind of dietary recommendations uh, we should be giving to individuals who are going to eat uh, non-conventional meat. Uh, in this era of precision medicine, uh, there is a tremendous uh, growing interest um, on a personalized nutrition or precision nutrition. The idea is to tailor individuals' uh, indiv uh, dietary recommendations to individual characteristics such as uh, genetic background, uh, microbiome, and so on and so forth, so that the dietary recommendations are, are more uh, effective for individuals to improve their health status. Uh, however, this kind of personalized approach may benefit only a small segment of the population, may actually widen uh, health disparities, which is a huge public health uh, problem in this country and elsewhere. So that's why we need public health nutrition and what's the uh, population-based approaches, such as policies and regulations, to improve our overall food environment. Uh, again, our individual eating behaviors are shaped by the food environment. If we don't have a healthy food environment, it's almost impossible for individuals to adapt healthy uh, eating behaviors. And as I just mentioned, our current food system is unhealthy and also not sustainable. It has a huge impact on the environment and undermine uh, both human and planetary health. And that's why we need a global food system transformation uh, in order to feed 10 billion people uh, a healthy and sustainable diet by 2050. So that's why I think it's important for us to look at the big picture and take an integrated approach to improve uh, personal population and planetary health, uh, human health and planetary health, uh, population health and uh, uh, personal health, they're all intertwined. Uh, I think future dietary guidelines uh, should um, take this integrated approach rather than focus on individual behavior changes uh, or personal uh, health uh, di or disease uh, preventions. And uh, to do that, I think we can uh, harness the, the advances and um, technologies as well as the tools uh, developed through several different uh, nutrition research areas, including uh, personalized nutrition, public health nutrition, and uh, planetary uh, nutrition. So my hope is that uh, future dietary guidelines would take uh, uh, a more integrated approach and also um, uh, focus on not just uh, uh, personal health, but also population health and uh, planetary health. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful presentation. We will now open it up for questions. Um, I'll bring the mic by, and mm -hmm. we might work a second mic if we need. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. A very thorough and a very um, balanced presentation. <laughs> but uh, as you know, there were, there were uh, extraordinarily contentious discussions around sustainability, including in Congress. So, and I'm wondering, from your point of view, as I look at the guidelines, 2015. They, they really are, um, a, there is a sustainable diet approach, whole grains, fruits, vegetables. So what do you think was missed by not having more of an emphasis on sustainability? And two, two, because I, I can't mm -hmm. leave without asking this, I can't imagine you or Alice serving on a committee in 2020 where uh, the material you're allowed to review is censored. If you were asked by a journalist what, what should the pushback be from the current committee, I'm interested in your reaction. Well, <laughs> um, regarding your first question, I, I think uh, the key issue is the uh, recommendation on um, reducing red meat consumption. Uh, so we're talking about... Uh, right, yeah, but you have to take something out in order to eat a plant-based diet, right? So uh, I think uh, uh, when we talk about the, the shift 
from meat-based diet to a more plant-based diet, we're talking about not just the behavior changes, but also uh, changes in the, uh, the food system, even the agriculture production. And currently, as you know, um, I mean, the uh, uh, agriculture production has been heavily focused on uh, meat production. And uh, it's very inefficient and uh, also has a huge impact on our natural resources. And so the question is, if we're going to shift from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet, how that's going to impact um, the agriculture system and uh, the livestock uh, sector and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's not a, just a flip side of the uh, recommendation, I think. Uh, well, more plant-based. Not we're not talking about vegetarians or, or vegans. I think right. Yeah. So, but without addressing the red meat issue uh, or the meat production issue, it, it's very very difficult, almost impossible to address the other side of the coin. What's your second? All right. <laughs> Well, uh, 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 Alisa, do you want to respond? <laughs> I, I can say that a lot, of journalists, a lot of journalists are asking that, and I have a lot of sympathy for the people that are serving on the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Committee, and I think it's probably not helpful, certainly for me, to um, add my two cents. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I don't envy the job of our colleagues on the 2020 committee. We were uh, relatively lucky uh, in 2015. Uh, this kind of media coverage didn't start until the report was published online. So we were able to focus on our work uh, uh, during the DGSA process. So, um, but now I, I think uh, uh, there are already a lot of controversy and a lot of internal, uh, external debate regarding the 2020 process. Um. Hi, um, my name is Stacey Griswold. I'm a first year PhD student. I have two questions for you, one specific and one general. The specific question was when you talked about the three things that have been limited. One was um, reference to climate change. The other was using meta-analyses that were not um, originated from the USDA. And the other was using research pre-2000. Yeah. That third one, I don't get that. So if you yeah. could talk about that. Yeah, that was what's so surprising to me. If you look at the, the published protocol on the 2020 DJSA website, is that, that uh, uh, they're only going to do systematic reviews for studies published after 2000. I think this is problematic, especially for some areas. Uh, for example, for uh, dietary fats and cardiovascular disease, most of the randomized clinical trials, including the feeding trials and uh, uh, heart disease prevention trials, were published a long time ago, uh, some of them published in the 1960s and 1970s. It would, wouldn't be possible to replicate this kind of trials uh, uh, today. So if you are going to limit evidence uh, 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 studies published after 2000, you're going to uh, uh, miss uh, uh, a lot of important uh, evidence in, in this area. So uh, I think this is a concern, a uh, very important concern, and several organizations uh, have written uh, letters to um, the DJC, uh, 2020 DJC, and also USDA, and ask them to um, to change uh, this criteria. Uh, okay, thank you. Second question: um, Has there been any evidence that publication of the guidelines actually changes individual diet choice? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. If you, uh, I, I think the major, uh, the main purpose of the, um, the DGAs is to um, influence policies. Um, I mean, uh, by law, uh, the federal um, uh, food uh, programs um, like SNAP and um, uh, national school lunch programs and, and so on and so forth should follow the, the dietary guidelines. So I think that's 
very important because uh, those programs involve uh, millions and millions of uh, children and, and adults. And the dietary guidelines are also very important in terms of changing some uh, nutrition policies. For example, uh, recently the FDA um, revamped the uh, nutrition facts labels uh, by including a new item on uh, the amount of added sugar on the labels. So currently we have only the total amount of sugar for the, uh, um, the packaged food or, or, or uh, beverages. Uh, but uh, very soon you will see the, the amount of added sugar on the, um, the nutrient facts label. That was recommended by the 2015 DGAC. So I think this kind of impact is population-wide, is huge. And uh, in terms of individual behavior changes, I think it's very difficult to assess whether that's due to uh, uh, their uh, reading of the uh, dietary guidelines or due to the changes in the food environment. But uh, again, I think uh, we should think about the impact from uh, both uh, individual and population point of view, not just to uh, focus on individual behavior changes, because without changing the food environment, it's, it's just extremely difficult to change uh, individual behaviors. Thank you, Frank, for a great, uh, a great talk. Um, just a quick note, I think you just maybe misspoke. The uh, SNAP does not need to follow the dietary guidelines. School lunch does, but SNAP does okay. not. Um, for um, a quick comment and then a question. So I think it's problematic that the USDA is constraining questions, but I also point out that the panel itself constrained its own questions due to time. And one of the major problems of the 2015 process, which was 95% in my mind outstanding, was there wasn't a specific question about the differential health effects of red meat unprocessed red meat and processed meat, the committee didn't set up that question, which led to a generalized recommendation that combined red meat and processed meat together, and then led to the backlash that has now led to the USDA. And so I think that was a mistake, to, because they have seen a very different health effects, at least for cardiovascular disease. But my, my question is, I guess related, is um, you mentioned your um, op-ed about plant-based meats. Now people are getting confused mm -hmm. that plant-based meats could be healthy. And yet you yourself, are, as a leader, a world-recognized uh, thought leader, are using the term plant-based as a synonym for healthy diets. And most of what's harmful in the global food supply is plant-based. And so refined starch, trans fat, sodium, added sugars, m much of what's harmful in the food supply is plant-based. And many animal products are not harmful and are even beneficial. So I urge you, and I the question is, can, you, can we come up with a different term as the nutrition community, because plant-based is the wrong term. I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. You mean minimally processed, phenolic-rich, mm -hmm. bioactive-rich foods. That's complicated. So how can we come up with a different term? Because <laughs> so what's your suggestion? Yeah, yeah, that's my my. <laughs> so I think plant-based is. The, is the, I, I guess tell me if you disagree. I think plant-based right. is the wrong term. Well, <coughs> so plant-based meat alternatives are not a new phenomenon. I mean, it's no uh, uh, tofu, which is a soy product uh, is the plant-based um, meat alternative which has been used for centuries in uh, many a Asian populations. And, and also there are many uh, um, plant-based uh, or vegetarian foods and, or vegan foods uh, in, the, in the U.S. market. Uh, I think what's uh, interesting about the new generation of uh, the plant-based meat alternatives such as Impossible Burgers or, or Beyond Burgers is that uh, uh, those foods are engineered to replicate the taste and the uh, texture of uh, eating meat. And that's why they appear to much broader uh, consumer base than the traditional vegetarian foods. So this term, plant-based meat alternative, is, is a huge category. So you have a healthy uh, plant-based alternatives like tofu or tofu type of uh, product. You have some vegetarian foods based on um, real foods, not uh, purified ingredients. Now you have the new generation of uh, uh, ultra-processed uh, 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 plant-based meat alternatives based on uh, purified um, protein isolates uh, and added with, added, uh, uh, with many added uh, ingredients. So it's a, it's a big category, and I, I don't know what's the best way to actually separate those, uh, those categories. I think I wasn't clear. I, I meant, I mm -hmm. As an example, I think I wasn't clear. I meant the entire category of ultra-processed plant-based foods, wheat, corn, mm -hmm. rice, much of what's harmful in the food supply is plant-based, ultra-processed wheat, sugars, corn, soy. They're all plant-based. Rice cakes, white rice, mm -hmm. white bread, crackers, 
breakfast cereals, sugary breakfast cereals. So they're all plant-based. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's, is, that, is that not the wrong term? Because we can push people away from healthy foods like yogurt and fish and, and potentially cheese and toward, you know, special K and cornflakes and, mm-hmm. and other things that are plant-based but, but bad for health. That's yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I, I think, it, I mean, there is a kind of a, a healthy halo uh, surrounding the term plant-based. Um, but certainly we have to uh, be mindful about, I mean, the health for plant-based diet, and unhealth for plant-based diets. That's what we found when we I mean, separated different types of uh, plant-based uh, diets. And going back to your question regarding pro- uh, red meat and processed meat, I, I think the, the approach we took is pattern-based approach rather than uh, individual food-based approach. I mean, certainly if you look at red meat and processed meat separately, the, uh, the harmful effects of uh, uh, processed red meat uh, are much greater than uh, unprocessed red, red meat. Uh, that's something I think, I hope, I mean, the 2020 uh, committee will uh, look at, but it looks like uh, <laughs> this is not something they're going to do. But uh, again, the pattern-based approach is still uh, more, um, more inclusive and, and also uh, more holistic than just looking at each of the food separately. One of the other issues was mm-hmm. that we did at one point start mm-hmm. trying to separate the fresh meat from the processed meat. And the problem mm-hmm. is that the majority, I believe it was the majority of um, the data actually had combined them. So it wasn't until more recently that they were separated. So we didn't mm-hmm. have an adequate um, database on which to distinguish. But I think we actually noted that. We have time for a couple more questions. I see one in the back. Um, Thank you for the presentation. Um, So I'm wondering, I saw that you were on the food safety and sustainability um, panel, and I'm wondering about your thoughts um, around um, antimicrobial resistance and as we um, and and risks from say uh, animal and plant based foods and 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 how as we're shifting these recommendations how do we consider food safety um, in in this dialogue? Yeah. So uh, in our subcommittee, we dealt with two food safety issues. Uh, one is uh, contamination. Um, I mean, that was has been dealt with uh, uh, in previous um, uh, DJs. Another issue is uh, potential safety issue with uh, high caffeine intake, um, and uh, we didn't deal with uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. And certainly, it's a long-standing concern. Uh, in uh, meat production, um, and um, uh, I, I think this is another uh, rationale uh, regarding uh, shift uh, the meat production to production of uh, uh, healthful plant-based foods. Yeah, uh, in one of the uh, chapters, we dealt with the, um, the, the affordability issue, but um, uh, those are more policy-related, uh, and uh, they were not uh, mentioned in the, uh, the DJs. So, yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, so while it's great that the guidelines are updated frequently so that they're not outdated and based on old science, also, I could see um, there being a concern with, like, why should I believe this if it's just going to change in five years? So I'm just curious. I mean, and there's also, like, people mistrust government. The way they think <laughs> so I'm just curious if you could comment on your or the committee's um, uh, about the getting the public or the, you know, policymakers or health professionals who you said as a target audience, anybody to trust the guidelines. Well, again, I, I think uh, uh, the main purpose uh, of the DJs is to influence policies. And I, I think that uh, uh, what had already been achieved with uh, some of the, uh, the federal um, food assistance programs and with the um, 
the uh, revised FDA uh, nutrition facts labeling. In terms of the trust on the guidelines, I think there are two issues. One is, I mean, uh, naturally, uh, many people don't trust the government for a variety of reasons. That uh, there is nothing we can do about that. And secondly, is the credibility of the science. And as you know, there has been a lot of misinformation and fake news about nutrition. A lot of confusion about nutrition and. Uh, Almost every day, you will see um, uh, uh, sensational headlines about certain diets and, and certain foods. And um, I, I think, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's a good thing. Um, people, everyone uh, is interested in nutrition because everyone eats. And there has been a lot of, a lot of exciting uh, new research on, on diet and, and health. So that's very positive. On the other hand, uh, it's very easy for the media, for the authors, and that was for the journals to exaggerate uh, their findings and oversimplify uh, complicated nutrition messages. So what can we do? I mean, as um, researchers and as um, uh, nutritional students, I, I think we should always uh, take a step back and uh, look at uh, the totality of evidence and, and uh, the quality of evidence uh, the newest study is not always the most reliable study. And, and also, um, nutrition communication is extremely important because it, a lot of the misinformation and, uh, uh, and, and the confusion is due to um, uh, miscommunications. And I think, I mean, your school has played a very important role in terms of uh, uh, improving nutrition communications and nutrition message disseminations. So we are also trying to uh, do more in this area. We have um, a website called uh, Nutrition Source, um, and uh, it's run by our department. Uh, the goal is to provide evidence-based, uh, timely nutrition uh, information and debunk some of the the myths, uh, nutrition common nutrition myths. Um, and uh, it turns out, uh, Nutrition Source is the most popular website uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. It accounts for 40 percent of all internet traffic at the school, 40%. Just a nutrition source, just one, one, one website. So again, people are extremely interested in nutrition. It's a great um, uh, resource for uh, journalists, for health professionals, for uh, the general public. But I think uh, we should do more in terms of improving our uh, nutrition communication uh, efforts. We have time for one more question, and this should be our last one. Looks like you're getting a lot of exercise. <laughs> I am. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is about the impact of meat consumption on climate change. Um, this was a topic of discussion at ASN, and I, in response to the Eat Lancet report, and I don't remember the name of the presenter, but he was pounding his fist, oh. and he was saying the real contributor to climate change is that is transportation, and we're sort of barking up the wrong tree when we emphasize meat consumption. So if we are all to become, let's say, vegan for a year, but we continue to fly regularly, is that going to have any impact on the planet, uh, on climate change? And should we, um, in the discussion of planetary health, also be talking about transportation? Yeah, I mean, transportation, uh, energy use, of course, is a very important contribute to climate change. But this doesn't mean uh, food production is not important. I think if you look at the uh, um, uh, wide range of uh, 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 reports um, and uh, the consensus, is that uh, our food production, our current food system, uh, contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the uh, estimate is uh, about 30%. And in our food system, of course, uh, uh, livestock sector, especially beef production, uh, have the highest, uh, the largest impact on, on greenhouse gas emissions and also on the degradation of uh, our uh, natural resources. So I think those two things are not mutually exclusive, and uh, we should do uh, uh, to both uh, to uh, maximize um, 
the, uh, our efforts to, um, to reduce uh, climate change. So one thing is, is important doesn't mean the other thing is not important. I, I think, uh, again, we should, should do, do both. And um, uh, food uh, production and food consumption offer a great opportunity not just to uh, reduce uh, the environmental impact, but also to improve uh, uh, the health of uh, our uh, uh, populations. So I think it's a, it's a double benefit in terms of improving uh, human health and the health of the planet. Let's thank Dr. Hugh for our wonderful <laughs> Okay, thank you.